Stop making these three mistakes with AI in your business without first listening to this entire episode. We will expose these mistakes and give you solutions to win. This is Phraseology plus AI with your hosts, Philippe and Miguel Santos. As a digital marketing professional specializing in SEO for over 20 years, I've worked with companies from startups to the global Fortune 500. Learn how to gain an unfair advantage with AI as we uncover tips, tools, and strategies. Meet S.A. Grant, a resilient and trailblazing entrepreneur who's dealt with some serious obstacles to come out the other side victorious. 20 years building up all sorts of skills in digital marketing and business. S.A. has uh, mastered business growth and is here to help you become an even better you. Now, with that, uh, Grant, uh, f- feel free, like S.A. Grant, feel free to go in and uh, talk a little bit about yourself and uh, give, uh, give everybody some uh, fodder here. Well, first and foremost, I just want to say thank you for having me on the show. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. I mean, especially in, in the AI space, it's, it's one of those things that I think most business owners are kind of scared of or they're completely passionate about. So I think we fall on the passionate side and we should be able to deliver some value to your listeners today. Um, as far as my story, I always say like, you know, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York as a kid and like my creative outlet was graffiti, um, you know, to the point to where I got arrested for it. And then out of nowhere, my parents decided to move to Atlanta, Georgia, dragging me kicking and screaming and, and cursing to the highest heavens. And when I got here, you know, it was a little bit tough and the conversion was a little bit difficult. But, you know, once I got into college and I realized that, you know, graphic design was art, it was just like graffiti it gave me an opportunity to kind of leverage my art in a different fashion. And I fell in love with it. But I was the weirdo amongst weirdos, if you can kind of believe that. Um, then shortly after that, I went and got my second degree, which was web design and multimedia. And I was a weirdo amongst those weirdos. So so kind of starting my own business in those days and just trying to figure things out and growing an agency and got married and, you know, got divorced and became a uh, the primary caregiver of my son. So I was a single dad at the same time, had a business. And literally what I did is I just devised this plan to say, hey, I want to get a master's degree, but I want to get paid to get it and I want to get it through osmosis. And what that really means is that I am not uh, going to college to get it. I already had two degrees. But I started to infiltrate corporate America to a certain extent. I worked for Apple for about nine months. I worked for Comcast for about 90 days. And I was just learning systems that I needed in my business at that time. If you fast forward a little bit, I you know, did that at the same time. I was a, you know, the dad of the basketball team coach. I was the dad that was also into everything that my son was doing at the same time. So I had to kind of be independent to be able to juggle and manage all those things and at the same time be a full-time entrepreneur. So if you fast forward about around 2018, I, you know, I was doing that for a long period of time. And unfortunately, I burnt my candlestick on both ends and I had a stroke. And the stroke was usually one of those things to where either you kind of completely give up on life. And for me, it was my eureka moment. It was my moment of awakening and awareness. And I was like, okay, like, what am I going to do next? And my girlfriend at the time, who's my wife now, she was like, well, since you're a brand guy, you've been branding everyone for like damn near the past 20 years. Why don't you self brand yourself? So I took that into heart. Took me about 18 months to make a full recovery post that recovery going into February of 2020, right at the time, a month before COVID hit is when I decided to kind of launch a new brand, which was essentially part of my original brand. And now it's called Boston cage. And the rest is essentially history. That's re- really amazing. And I, when I read this uh, about you, I was like, uh, just amazed. Like, how did you juggle all that stuff? It's it's hard enough doing a couple of those things. And I, I saw that you also uh, tried out different industries. You were kind of like doing a bunch of stuff to get yourself really sharp in all kinds of areas. M- really impressive. Yeah. And then the stroke on top of that. <laughs> I don't know. Because it's, it's like the light, it's like the light switch, you know, the light switch goes off, goes off. I mean, I think I would say I was not in the dark. I was kind of in the tunnel looking at the light. And then finally, after the stroke, I was out in the light and I kind of realized that everything I was doing was for a reason. I kind of did it maybe not the correct way, 100 percent, but I did it nonetheless. And everything that I did, I don't regret because I wouldn't be who I am right now if I didn't have that legacy to support it. Absolutely. And I, I can uh, reflect on that, like it, all these different uh, experiences and obstacles life throws that you definitely mm-hmm. kicks you into a different path, uh, makes you always makes you better. I feel like if you overcome them, you're always going to be better. hundred <laughs> percent. Essay, um, maybe share some insights, if you will, on how you've kind of used AI 
and how you kind of think about uh, data quality and quantity when it comes to getting things right. Mm. So I think one of the things about AI that people are aware of and also frightened is that one, it may sound generic, right? Two, in, in, in addition to it being generic, if you're leveraging it for work or if you're leveraging, you know, leveraging it for school, they can kind of do AI checkers to kind of see if that copy was written through AI. So the first thing I always say is, is customizing it. Like, like if you're using ChatGPT, logging into it, going into the back end and putting as much content you possibly can about you and your business. And that's the first thing that I did with ChatGPT is like I downloaded uh, about SA, about Boston Cage, about our services and try to consolidate all that within the space. I think it's 5,000 characters or something like that. So now every time I use that platform, it not only sounds like me, but it has the history of who I am and what I'm doing. And then the, the sugar on top, the cherry on top, which I think most people miss, is how do I then take that content and then convert it? And I always say Grammarly is a gold mine, especially now Grammarly has AI integrated into it. So you start with ChatGBT and then you leverage Grammarly to do all your your grammar corrections. You do it to say, hey, I need to expand or contract or make it shorter, make it more concise, make it sound more professional. And that's the, the two halves of a hemisphere that makes the, the outcome a whole. That, that, that's that's something uh, I wanted to touch on because uh, you brought up a good point about the uh, you know the use of detection, right? Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, there are tools that do it well, tools that are, are doing it poorly, and I think even the uh, big players, OpenAI, Claude, all of those are trying to actually put out their own ways of having it detected, so that mm -hmm. you can uh, you know folks that need it can do it. Um, but the best example that I saw that just is kind of ridiculous. Uh, is that a teacher wanted to catch her students in the act of using, uh, right. you know, AI? So she was inserting white text, smallest as possible, and then put in something like uh, apples and bananas, something that would never show up in the in the, the the book report or whatever it was. And that way, she could tell. She could just do a quick search and find out if it was generated through AI. So it's kind of hilarious right. how people are using it nowadays. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think it's easy to just read the content, right? I mean, obviously, you generate it, read through it, because again, AI is only going to create what you tell it to create. Absolutely, yeah. It's uh, obviously AI is also trained on specific information, so it's going to use a lot of the same vocabulary, and you can kind of even pick it out by you know eyesight by looking at this content. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I think that's why Grammarly makes it to where you can kind of take that content, have it paraphrased or expanded or contracted to where it's going to substitute based upon if I'm talking to a professional or if I'm talking to someone that is a professor in school, Grammarly can kind of dissect that and orchestrate that information for you in that direction. Yeah, that, that, that's that's incredible. I mean, I, I know that we've like seen some examples here and there, and obviously things are, are changing, right? But in, in your experience and like how you've been running with AI, uh, have you kind of seen any specific AI technologies that have like revolutionized your marketing campaigns or worked on your like maybe improving your ROI? I think collectively, I mean, there's so many different tools out there. I mean, just starting from the AI art tools, I think it does not really matter of the tool. Like the tools are essentially all based upon the same principles of leveraging the, the wide web as it is and all the content reference points that AI have access to. But it really comes down to the prompt engineering. And I, even recently on Facebook and on LinkedIn, I had made a post and I was like, look, if you wonder how my visuals come out to look exactly the way I want them to look on a on over and over again or have like the branding or the color treatment that Boston Cage has is because I've studied how to engineer the prompts. That is the first and foremost thing that people need to do. It's not just say, create an image with a hat. If you tell something to create an image with a hat, that hat can be any one of the colors and it could be anything. You have to kind of be very detail oriented. And I always say, look at it as like layering a sandwich. If I say, make me a sandwich, you can make me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. But if I say, hey, I want a sandwich with salami, I want it on this type of bread, this type of mayo, this type of mustard, and I'm, I'm articulating every aspect of that sandwich, and then I'm making it into a recipe, then step and repeat it, that's how AI, it, just think of it from that standpoint. And that's how you leverage it to make it do what you want it to do over and over again. And, and folks, uh, definitely follow SA because I have seen his uh, some of his artwork through these prompts, and uh, they're kind of incredible. So I, I know that even I think I'm okay at it, but that that just takes it to a new level. So <laughs> that's really awesome. Definitely listen to this advice. If you really put in the detail and the context, and you understand how to use prompts properly and give the mm -hmm. system the information and the context, you can uh, deliver some pretty cool output. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would say prompts are not a sentence. I mean, I look at like my prompts are usually they could be an essay sometimes. Like literally, they're they're uh, like pages sometimes for me to get the detail and to get it as consistently as I want. You know, recently I also produced um, like my tenth book, right? And this book was a kids book, and I wanted to figure out how do I dial in on the characters of this book in the same exact style, but again, I want the characters to look the same, and it's through detailing out those prompts I was able to do that. You, you know that that brings me to uh, two really interesting uh, side questions, right? Uh, one is how do you kind of keep consistency with your characters? So, prime example, like even when I'm building a character off of my representation or a character in the storyline, the first thing I, I want to think about is who is the character. So it kind of really goes back to old school animation storyboarding. Like you have to kind of understand. So what I would do is say, okay, I'm looking for a multiracial kid age seven, curly hair, glasses, hat. And then after that, then I'll go back in and say, okay, he needs to have purple glasses. He needs to have a red hat. He needs to have black jeans. He needs to have Nikes or whatever. And then keep layering it in, like I said before. And then what I'll do is I'll render it through a couple of times to see the consistency, to see, okay, if I look at five images, if I'm looking at this on page one versus page 20, there may be some differences, but for a user, could they really tell the difference? Could they tell that this kid is, is more Spanish and African American or is he more Caucasian and African American? And once I get to that point, there's no real way of telling it, then it makes it easier for me to step and repeat that. Yeah, that, that's really cool. I mean, I've seen that some tools have face lock. So in theory, mm -hmm. they try to keep it as close as possible, but not all tools have that. So I think the, the, the magic comes in like understanding your prompts and how you can get it to look at least very close to what you originally conceptualized, right? 100%, 100%, it's just, it's just detail. I mean, it's just, you just can't say general. general. Generalizing anything in AI does not work. That's why most people complain about, hey, I tried AI, it doesn't work. Well, you're generalizing. It's just like if I go to a store and I say, hey, I need that thing and I'm in Walmart, what damn thing are you talking about? Like you have to kind of detail and you have to itemize it out for it to be successful. Good point. Good point. I, I mean, second part of that question was kind of like related to uh, maybe your insight and your opinion on what's going to happen with these prompts, because do you imagine these prompts will continue being uh, potentially essay long, or do you think that they're going to get smarter or have to use memory uh, maybe to expand, to make it easier for people? I would think if they look at it as far as like web development, where, you know, back at one time you would build an entire website based upon HTML. And then after HTML, there was PHP and CSS. It was all these different things. So if you look at CSS, CSS essentially controls the visual, it controls the colors. And that's a segmentation that's separate from the actual architecture of a website. Once we get to that point to where you have these little nuggets of includes to say, hey, I need that character from book B and now I need to add extra things to it and I don't have to rewrite that. I can kind of save that nugget of information and it could just be an image or a character or an icon. That's when I think things will get a lot easier because again, right now you have to write everything out or you have to save it in some kind of document. There should be a, a, a opportunity to save that and have just an icon. I click the icon and then I add everything else after that. All right. That, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I, I'm looking forward to the time when you can actually have it, it kind of understands ex exactly where you're going uh, without all this extra context. But, you know, right now it's the important thing is understanding how to use it, use that as a mm. skill. Um, so so really great point. I, I wanted to like expand a little bit then um, mm. since since these tools have been very helpful in terms of creating uh, artistic and visual uh, representations of things that you need. Uh, have you also like used it for anything else that kind of delivers on a uh, return for your businesses, like uh, something specific that you've, you really think has changed the game? I'm a big systems guy. So for me, it's always leveraging content at, at scale. So one thing that I did, and I did this test maybe about 18 months ago when AI was like kind of first commercialized. And if you look at my LinkedIn profile and my Facebook profiles every day, two times a day, it will post a content of uh, one of my notebooks. And you'll see it's a picture of myself, a notebook is in a frame, and the content is usually different for each post. All of that content came from me grabbing the concept of NFTs, like how NFTs were created at scale, it was how people were able to create 10,000 NFTs, and then leveraging the AI tool to then generate the content. 
So I would say, hey, here's 10,000 images that I generated based upon variables. And now I need you to do, be descriptive on here's 20 different inputs. I need you to talk about the book. I need you to talk about why you want the book. I need you to talk about the colors of the book. And then I would go into a database, a spreadsheet, and then leverage that spreadsheet as a CSV file, upload it to AI and say, AI, I need you to, to take this content and I need you to generate 100 or 300 or 10,000 variables of that contest. Once you get to that level, then the content creates itself. So what I ended up doing was I created, I think it was seven years worth of content to post two posts per day, every day for seven years on autopilot. I don't know about anyone else, but I, I feel like, you know, poof, mind blown, right? Because the thing is, uh, we've always chased scale, especially being in marketing. I think it's important to like chase scale to some degree. Yes, you want it to be of the highest quality, but scale is also important. Mm. If you the, the more you do, the more you, in theory, get as long as it's consistent, right? Mm. So I love, I love that kind of uh, representation of using variables. I think a lot of folks may not be at that sophistication level yet, mm. but uh, if you learn the simple, uh, simple like basics about these tools, you can learn how to use the variables, and I think that's a key, a key thing that you just mentioned right there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think some people they forgot about NFTs. I mean, NFTs is, is like the dawn of something else. But there were so many different projects based upon creating these NFT packages of having ten thousand different variables of images. Well, again, you don't have to use that for NFT. You could use that for anything else. Why would you not use that to create content instead of trying to create content every single day when you can create years of content and then have it post on autopilot? So. Absolutely. And, and the funny thing is, uh, most people know about NFTs on like Ethereum, uh, but mm -hmm. the, even Bitcoin had their revolution last year with like some uh, inscriptions and other stuff, which is very similar and stamps. So kind of cool to, to see that that technology, that kind of concept methodology is kind of being applied right now uh, to AI as well. And, uh, and probably has been here for a long time. It's just a matter of making it yeah. easier easier for people to tap into right using these tools hell yeah hell yeah i mean i look at it as like legos man it's like different types of colors legos different types of shapes and again nfts ai automation systems they're to me they're just lego pieces how do i make different things by putting them in different sequences yeah excellently and that's that's well said I, you know uh, i say i was thinking a little bit more about like how entrepreneurs because you are your kind of career is pro prolific here right and you're you're doing everything you can to make your brand stand out you're, you're building multiple businesses in this case like you're using different skills how, how can an entrepreneur or a small business specifically kind of use uh ai to really optimize and kind of push their workflow ahead with uh with regards to marketing i think first thing is more so mindset right i mean you have to be able to be okay understanding that this is technology that's not going to go anywhere it's going to change and evolve and we're at the dawn of it so that's the first thing is accepted secondary to accepting it is to actually utilize it not utilize it for work just utilize it i mean like when alexa google siri first came out and you could ask my wife for proof of this and it's, it's hilarious i would literally sit down on a random tuesday from eight o'clock to nine o'clock and i would have a conversation with alexa i'd be like hey, alexa tell me this hey alexa what's the square foot of this you know how many people are there located in this particular region how many square miles and i would just ask and just keep spinning on and i was like, okay i can get access to content really really quick now what can i utilize that content for and then once ai came around it kind of took alexa and google to a whole nother like level to where now literally when i'm doing podcasts or if i'm uh, producing a podcast i can create content based upon what somebody is talking about live on that episode and regurgitate that content on demand, which is completely like universally outstanding in comparison to five years ago before we even had this technology. I have to say uh, Amazon probably loves you because they, they probably got so much value out of you asking all those questions and being curious. I mean, yeah, yeah. And I'm playful with it too. I mean, I'll curse her out just to see what she would say that I would ask her. And then, you know, you could tell her Simon says, and then she will repeat exactly what you say. So it was just like all these different variables of conversation. To, so when AI came out, I was kind of like ready for it because I was doing all this with Google and, and Alexa and now having this more of a robust platform that could render out content at scale based upon what I wanted to do. I was just like, dude, I wish Alexa and Google was like this three, four years ago. It's funny that you mentioned that because like, even though I don't consider myself a rude person, I did the same thing to uh, the Google appliance because I was like, yeah. just, hey, what, what's it going to respond? How is it going to respond? Is it going to like actually be a robot or is it going to try to be a little human? Yeah, yeah. And I think AI is a little bit more human than, than Alexa and, and Google. Cause, I mean, as the more and more you use AI, 
they'd say it doesn't have memory, but it kind of remembers the past chats to a certain extent. And obviously, if you put that data point in it, like I'm at the point now with my, I'm like, hey, if I was S.A. Grant, what would he say? If this was Boston Cage, what would that content look like? And literally, I asked it about almost every variation. Hey, if I was S.A. Grant, he wanted to go on vacation. Where do you think he would like to go on vacation? And because it knows all the information about me and all the variables, nine out of 10 times, it'll give me a list of things that, and I'm sitting there like, damn, you know me better than I know my damn self. <laughs> it's true. At, at, at least the memory's there, right? <laughs> yeah, at least the memory's there. Oh my goodness. Well, that, that brings me to a, a good point that you bring up here, which is uh, deep fakes, right? Like, and, and uh, like stuff that is coming along that is really scary. For example, 15 seconds of your, of your voice can now turn into any text to audio transcription using your voice. It's pretty crazy, right? Yep. Oh, so, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love it too, but like at the, at the end of the day, like there are scenarios where, you know, bad actors could use it very easily. It's basically like one of the key, key things is like having a safe word, right? <laughs> Cause like uh, your friends and family, they, they need to know that at least like if it looks real, acts mm. real, but it's not real, there's mm. a way to determine it. Mm. Mm. So what do you, uh, what advice would you give to, to folks that, um, run businesses and that are like doing, using a lot of AI so that they can kind of better protect themselves from scenarios that are as risky as like having deep fakes out there and not being able to combat it. I, I think that that's, that's difficult. It's like saying, how do you prevent from being hacked? Right. And again, like we've seen over the years that even that the highest profile and highest security individuals would get hacked because again, it's only a matter of time. And it kind of goes back to what I originally said is to become fluent with those systems, to understand them, to leverage them, to use them. Like per personally for myself, I have maybe three virtual avatars that look exactly like me and they all have my voice. So, but that allows me and my company to create courses and videos at scale without me having to interject in it. Now, obviously, if you know me and you know my body language, and you know my mannerisms, and if you're listening to an AI, it's close, but it's not 100%. So it's more so about knowing who you are and have your company, you know, obviously, if you're a CEO, if you don't record content, I will start recording content right now. So that way you have a proof of concept to say this is the real person versus this is the avatar. And then people get accustomed to like Gary V. It's going to be really hard for AI to dial into Gary V because he has so much video content of himself and his mannerisms, the way he curses, the way he blinks, the way he moves his head. AI is a little bit limited to where it cannot comprehend and recreate all of that currently right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Good point. So keep your wits about you, keep knowledgeable and be experimental. It'll, it'll be the smartest thing you can do, right? <laughs> A hundred percent. And like I said, just use it. You just get into the point to where you're using and using and using it. And then obviously when things become more secure, at least you're not playing catch up, trying to figure out how to use it and then secure it. I, I actually think we're in the minority because I, I last uh, statistics that I read, a lot of people just aren't using AI enough or aren't using AI or are hesitant to use it. So I think uh, that's, that's advice that I would put out there is like the same. Um, definitely use it, mm. get familiar because it's coming and it's, there's no putting that genie back in the bottle. <laughs> It's, no, it's, it's here to stay. I mean, it, I think all the variants of everything that we've seen throughout technology, throughout life, prime example, chat. It's funny that AI is referring to chats when, again, you look at chat being the first thing that AOL did back in the 90s, right? It's the same exact formatting, the same exact messenger, but now this messenger is not somebody on the other side. It's an AI bot that's responding. Same exact concept, different application. Love it. Yeah, I, I, I'm thinking immediately of ICQ. Uh, I feel like I'm really dating myself at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're not going to awesome. get into the black, the dark web or anything like that, but yes, yes. Exactly. No, I, I think that's a whole different topic for a whole different video. Mm -hmm. um, with, with that, let, let's, let's kind of turn a little bit to like your recommendations on uh, mm -hmm. tools that you like to use and that you think other entrepreneurs could kind of leverage for their marketing and maybe even beyond marketing. So I would think pound for pound, anyone that does any type of recording, um, it's like it's facetious for me to say because I actually wanted to build this platform, but they already built it and it's like I'm not going to compete against them. I would say Cast Magic. If you have not heard of Cast Magic, if you have not used Cast Magic, Cast Magic is a powerhouse when it comes to like AI, right? And again, you could have a podcast, you could have a video, you could have any audio based content. It can transcribe it and then what it does, it applies the AI. So I, when I upload my podcast or my team uploads the podcast, by default, I can say, hey, I need you to create show notes. I need you to create a, a bio. I need you to create an outline. I, I could tell it to do all these different things, 
before it even has the content. So once the content comes in, it automatically will then render it, transcribe it, read it, and then create the new content for me on the fly without me having to do anything besides upload the original audio file. Sounds like a really uh, smart uh, Swiss Army knife. <laughs> it, it definitely is. I mean, so another one that I like um, as far as images, and the reason why I like this one is because it runs on mobile. And it just makes it makes high res images. It kind of has all these preset um, backgrounds, preset styles. Wonder.ai. And when I got Wonder.ai, I think they had a lifetime deal, so I have access to create unlimited anything. I don't know how much it costs right now, but if you'd never heard of Wonder AI, I would definitely kind of download it on the app and kind of play with it because. Unlike the other rendering tools where you have to kind of figure out what's going on, it has these presets to say, hey, I, I need this painting or this image to look like Van Gogh. And then after that, then you're layering in your actual um, prompt. So think about that. If I needed to say I needed to look like this and I needed to be this, I, that's essentially two prompts. So one prompt is already done for me. I needed to look like Van Gogh's painting, and then I could focus on the details of the content versus the atmosphere or the background or the stylistic look of it. Yeah, that, that's that's amazing. I have not heard of Wonder, but I I, I, I can imagine that it'd be extremely helpful. <laughs> extremely helpful. I mean, it just it makes it consistency as far as images. I think that's the other thing too. A lot of times, if you're figuring out a style with your prompt you have to detail that style as much as you have to detail the subject matter of the image and the subject matter of the background. That just removes that extra element to where you can actually focus. And if you look at my images, my images, I focus on the actual subject matter. I don't really have to focus on the style because I'm just selecting the style that I want. And then I'm putting all my content into the subject matter to make it look exactly the way I want it to look. Yeah, that's impressive. Then uh, I know you mentioned the prompt engineering. I guess this kind of cuts out a couple steps. I mean, it's, I mean, my prompts are still long, but if I didn't have them when I first started out, my prompts were ten times longer because I had to. Hey, I needed to be like Van Gogh. I needed to be this color. I need to be like Starry Night. And again, you're putting all this detail before I even say, "What are you creating?" Okay, I'm doing all these Van Gogh things, but what am I making again? And that's when you start the prompt about the subject matter versus about the actual style of the image. Now, do you kind of like, I know this is a, a little weird, but like, do you kind of put it into a notepad and to document, like when you have these long prompts, are you just kind of like, how are you storing them? Because I'm pretty sure you'd want to reuse some of them, right? Yeah, so I mean, obviously notepads is really good. I use notepads on my phone. Um, the cool thing about Wonder with their last release in the flag, maybe the last four months, it has a memory tool in it. So it, it remembers up to like the last 15 prompts. So if you're building, and again, when you're building prompts, you're, all it is is like Photoshop layers. You're just layering it and layering it. So once you get that final prompt, it's usually in your memory for the next time you log in and then you can just copy it and save it in a notepad or a spreadsheet. I'm, I'm really big on databases. So that's something that I'm building behind the scenes right now is leveraging all my different prompts for all our different content matter and just put it in a spreadsheet. So that way I can delegate that to my team when the time comes. Love that. That's, that's a great tip right there. <laughs> Mistake number two, right? So this is basically overlooking expertise and oversight when using AI mm. and kind of like, uh, I think between that and harnessing AI for business growth and strategy. So like really understanding how to not make that mistake. How do you, how do you make sure that you have expertise and oversight involved in all of your uh, AI developments, generating, uh, and use of tools? Um, mm. I would love to kind of get your, your idea on how you kind of mitigate that and how you kind of control the, the quality flow of that. I would say just creating a system. I mean, it's literally documenting those processes. And if you look at any successful business, most of their processes are documented. So that way they don't have to think about it. And every time something new comes up, they'll document that process and they'll add it to that new system. So if you have 15 steps, you may end up with 20 steps. You have to add the new five steps, but you never have to do anything with the first 15 unless there's a tweak or, or something that needs to be adapted. So that's the first and foremost thing with that. Um, in addition to that is just understanding the principles of your business. If you're creating content, what kind of content do you want to create? How do you want that content to be perceived? And that goes into like branding. Like if you don't understand branding, then your content is going to be falling to the wayside. One of the things that we do at Boston Cage is that we have like 
brand specs. Like this is our 12 colors. And again, you don't want to just start off with one or two colors. You want to have secondary colors. You want to have complementary colors because you never know what's this brand going to be used on. And it may just not be used on print. It may be used outside of web. It may be used on the back of a bus. It may be used on, on an LCD screen. You want to think about all the variables and you don't want to be limited to where you're pigeonholed to just red and black. So red and black looks good on pretty much anything, but there may be some limitations to where if you're only wearing black, your black type may not work, right? What's the substitute for that? So you want to think about the variables, you want to have branding, and again, put all of this into a system. And for those that don't know, SA is a brand master. So, <laughs> so this is the key thing. I, I definitely like, uh, I, I that resonates so hard because there is, there are so many different ways that you may not anticipate brand being used. So don't limit it. And then obviously if I've had some situations where smaller companies have kind of uh, built that brand, but then with like a freelancer, and then next thing you know, they don't know how to get that freelancer again, they can't make any changes and it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. They may not even have some of the source files. So that's key thing mm -hmm. to think about all of those variables, make sure you have access to them. Yeah. And I think to add on to that, I mean, obviously with today's market and today's technology, leveraging online tools, like, Obviously, Adobe is a great platform, but what I've learned is that, hey, you may have a team that's overseas. You may have a team that's not as versed in something as advanced as a pro tool like Adobe. So I'm not saying Canva is your best friend, but Canva-like environments that way you can kind of log into a platform. You could be anywhere in the world and you could at least have access to create or edit that content. Google Docs, Google Slides, all of those things, they're not the most design friendly, but once you kind of figure out like your style and your templates, then it makes it really easy for you to then outsource or hire freelancers because again, you can kind of see what they're doing versus waiting for them to render out something or to send you a link through Adobe to kind of look on to actually click and look at it when in reality you can kind of just log in and see what's going on to begin with. And you can do that with everything, whether it's video, audio, or images. Well, you, you talked you talked a lot about like workflow optimization and kind of thinking about like the ways that you could be a little bit more efficient, right? Uh, I, I I like to call that lean, but I, the, the thing is like mm. how how like give folks some advice on how to basically help automate their workflow or kind of think about how to break their workflow into pieces that they could automate. I would say look at it from like podcasting, right? We're doing podcasts. So my year one of podcasting, I didn't have any systems. I was just trying to figure out podcasting. And then I was trying to figure out how to be a, a host. And then shortly thereafter, I was like, okay, I need systems in place. So the first system that I implemented was an onboarding system. And that to me has saved me so much time and effort and it became a lead magnet. It became a resource for capital and everything else. So I'm going to explain to you how that happened, right? So if I'm getting someone on my show, yeah, I could talk to them and I could say, hey, I want you on my show. And then we can go back and forth about times and locations and software, or you can give them a booking link, right? And then once they get into that booking link, the time that's in there is based upon when you're available. Once they book it, then obviously they'll get an email, but then it goes past that. Where does that data go? Are they then doing something afterwards? So on my onboarding process is, hey, you booked your time. We're going to send you reminders five days, three days, one day, an hour before automatically. In addition to that, then you have to fill out a form. That form then goes into a database, and then that database then goes into a spreadsheet. And then from that spreadsheet, we create so many different variables of content and sourcing from that one bit of data that comes in. An example of that is our online directory. Our online directory would not have existed if we didn't have the data points of who we're interviewing, their social media platforms and their images. And before I used to search for that, or my team used to search for that. And I was like, why the hell are we searching for something that we're interviewing someone that should have that on demand? So pulling that data in and then regurgitating that data in our style and our look makes it 10 times easier to make an online directory, to make a book, to make um, show notes, all those different things that you want to make for a podcast. But unfortunately you have to kind of figure out your systems and then apply the layers to make it happen for you systematically. Now, now with that, obviously there's, uh, you know, there's some direct, many different directions you can go. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm, I'm wondering like how you basically use, how do you typically use the analytics and like maybe predictive analytics uh, with your systems and kind of getting things right? Like how do you normally like proceed there? So one example of that is, you know, on Boston Cage, like interview first season, 
I had general questions, like just general questions. And so as you're starting to interview people, you can kind of get like ratios to say, okay, people like this question or people always give this answer. So one of the things that I did was ask about books. Have you authored a book? Have you, um, what's your favorite book? Or if you could make a recommendation to a book that helped you in your journey, what would that book look like? And I started asking that question repeatedly in different ways. I would paraphrase it differently based upon who I'm interviewing. And then after about six months, I was looking at the data saying, okay, well, you know what? We've interviewed, let's say, 25 people. On average, each person gives us one to maybe four books. So let's say by the end of that, maybe we had 50 books. And I was like, we got 50 books. Now we've interviewed 500 people. So on average, five books times 500 gives us thousands of books what can we do with that content so part of that was then saying okay let's create a sub podcast because everyone reads books to a certain extent so we went from boston cage to boston cage book club podcast which essentially somebody can come on boston cage they're going to tell me about the books and if they've written a book then i'll invite them back to then talk about their book so again that information wouldn't have happened if that data wasn't present in the first two seasons for me to realize that, wow, we're sitting on a gold mine. Let's create this new podcast and also let's create a book club online directory to take all the books that people are recommending and put it there for our listeners to then showcase and go and review, purchase the books or review the books. Uh, I love that idea. And, and uh, I, I was immediately thinking about also uh, the fact that for those uh, folks that are really busy, like yourself, uh, you know, you might love reading, but some folks just don't have a lot of time to read or don't want to. <laughs> so like yeah. summarization tools, uh, using AI summarization tools can help a lot to get at least the gist of what's important about each of those books. So like if you have thousands of books, pretty sure you're not going to make that in a year. But uh, if you mm -hmm. summarize like the majority of the ones that maybe are on the top 50, top, top 20, uh, you'll get a lot out of that. Yeah. And I mean, to your point, I mean, you could leverage those books in so many different ways. I mean, you could then say, hey, give me a summary. Then you could take that summary and then turn that audio, I mean, turn that actual text into an audio file so you could have audio summaries. Then you could take that audio summary and then you could apply it to your avatar with your voice and make video summaries. So there's so many different steps that you can build and so much di different diversification of the same exact content, but the user gets to select how they want to, to receive that content, whether they want to read it, watch it, or listen to it. Yeah, that, that is a great tip. Uh, I love the fact that you kind of spun out a different business or a whole different podcast based off of the analytics. Uh, and the fact that you were kind of, uh, you're kind of shooting a little bit to see what worked mm -hmm. and then getting a really good uh, target hit and, uh, and making something valuable from that. So I really love that. That's a great example. Uh, let, let me ask you, uh, switching gears a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, what kind of practical tips do you have for entrepreneurs in terms of selecting and implementing AI tools? Because obviously you've been around the block with a lot of these tools. Maybe there are um, certain criteria that you think might help others understand their own mix. I, I would say, I mean, starting with like the baseline, is is the tool something that's user friendly to you? Because there's so many different usability cases, right? For us, maybe we're more technical. Maybe I want more options. Or if I'm not technical, I just want to be able to say, hey, I need this and it should be able to at least render something for you. And then maybe it has tips. Maybe there's also additional education with that platform to help you understand how to use it better. So again, I, I would say, look at it from the standpoint of how you like to be educated. Some people like to read, some people like video, some people like audio, some people like real world examples. However you like to learn, find that tool that matches your learning style. And once you do that, then the comprehension of using that tool will become 10 times easier versus you trying to be a scientist when you're an artist. Love that. Love that. I think that's uh, key. Um, really understanding something that works for you, right? <laughs> but but that's uh, harder said than, uh, said than done sometimes just because, okay, like let's say a couple hundred to new tools are coming out every week. Mm -hmm. Uh, how do people navigate that? Like, what's the best way to kind of stay up to date and at least determine mm -hmm. the tools that are going to be around for a little while? I think it's easy, right? Use a tool to find a tool, right? It, it almost is like saying, hey, hey, Google, tell me about Google. It, it's, it's really that simple. Hey, chat GBT, give, uh, there goes Google now in the background, but just tell chat GBT that, hey, I need tools to do X, Y, and Z. Could you create a list? That's a simple prompt. And by default, ChatGPT is going to give you something. 
And then it may give you, hey, this company, this company. Then after that, the next prompt would be, hey, do you mind creating an actual URL based list on your last chat? Again, I'm stacking the layers. Then now you have a bunch of links for these tools. And then you can kind of go back and say, oh, well, hey, I need a tool for this. Where can I find it? Or I need an international tool. I need a tool to do conversions. I need a tool to do multi-link. All these different things, again, it's at your fingertips. You just have to know how to pose those questions. Yeah, yeah, a really good point. Uh, I mean, have there been any really weird tools that you've come across? <laughs> you got me like thinking about this now. Wow, weird, weird tools. I'm just trying to think. You're talking about like as far as like AI tools? Yeah, yeah, or, or maybe even general, but like AI tools more so because I think it'd be really funny to hear if you've come across any that you thought were weird. I don't necessarily think that anything is necessarily weird. I mean, obviously, if someone put time and effort and money into it, it was for a reason. I think it's more so my ignorance until I figure out the why. Like, why did they create it? And then that once I figure out the why, then I can see the value or the value proposition of it and then put it into into like actual use or maybe not use for me. Because again, whatever reason they created it, it may not be something that, that we need. So I don't think anything is necessarily weird. Like I said before, I, I was the weirdo amongst weirdos. So I, I, my glass is essentially always half full or it's always overflowing and I'm always looking for the next opportunity or the next thing to dial in. So like something brand new could come out tomorrow. I may not dedicate all my time to it, but my ears is always going to be in the ground listening to see how could that be integrated into our current systems. Yeah. Thanks for entertaining me. I, I, I myself have also not come across one that I thought was mm -hmm. particularly weird, but mm -hmm. uh, cause to your point, there's probably a market for every tool. Uh, but I, I was kind of noticing some of the quality on, or some of the like concepts around some of these tools that created like mm. mini videos. Uh, I felt like mm. they were a little wacky, like maybe they didn't execute it just well, but to your point, maybe the prompt, maybe the, the way that I, I, uh, kind of engaged with the tool was not the best way. Yeah. I would say it's hundred percent prompts. I mean, like the first and foremost thing, like if, if anyone is listening right now, right, if you go to chat GPT and you say, Hey, I need you to create me a, uh, ad for Facebook, it's going to create you the ad for Facebook. But then if you say, Hey, I need you to create me an ad and then tell them about yourself, tell them about the company, tell them about the avatar, tell them about the results you're looking for. And then you compare the results between a and B, I guarantee you that the B results is going to make the a results look like child's play in comparison, because again, you're detailing out what you want it to give to you. It has access to everything. You just need to t identify what it needs to do with the information that it already knows that you don't know. Yeah, yeah, I think that's uh, the first mistake of any any newbie, right? And that is like just not giving it enough, thinking uh, a couple of words will be enough because we're used to doing that now on Google. You know what I mean? Like yeah. the Google yeah. thing, it's it's not the same. It's it's no. still like developing. <laughs> it's not keyword driven. It's not SEO driven. It, it is a hundred percent driven on the data points that it has access to, and it's it's learning as well. So I mean, it's it's something that you just have to change the way you do search because I'm at the point now to where all my search or at least nine out of 10 of them, I don't even go to Google no more. I just go to chat GBT or I go to any AI platform. Cause again, it, it gives you different results versus Google. You're paying to play. <laughs> it's only going to show you who's paying first and then who's optimized second. And then on page 10 is somebody that it just happened to find through scrolling and putting out spider webs to find that information. So again, all the information's here versus, Hey, paid optimize and then crawling tumultuous times and I, I can kind of uh, agree with you on in terms of like people kind of shifting behaviors and Google trying to keep up with that but not really doing so well <laughs> but that being said I mean <laughs> that's the it's just an opinion but it seems yeah. to be going that direction um, yeah. what, what what do you think like maybe give folks some insights on like how they can stay ahead of this curve uh, because it's evolving so rapidly and I think uh, with that change in behavior, uh, you have to also understand yourself. Like, how can folks stay ahead of that? I would say the first thing is, is be okay with being unique and being different, not caring what anyone else thinks, and and then playing with these environments. Kind of like what I said earlier about playing with Alexa. Most people wouldn't think to sit down and to have conversations with Alexa over and over again to kind of see the extent of the content. Back in the day, you would have to go to the library or you'd have to have encyclopedias at home to find this data but now you have this data at your fingertips and obviously you could vocally ask or in today's world, you could then type it in chat GPT and get instant gratification and instant results. So I would say you want to be more honed in on the technology 
that makes you feel uncomfortable will be okay with being uncomfortable until it becomes something that you understand and comprehend. Do not worry about the outside world, because if you do that, then you become the mundane. You become the everyday person. I say you got me thinking about Grolier and, uh, and Encyclopedia Britannica now. Wow, that's been a, it's been a while. It's been a minute since I heard about those. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but think about that. I mean, like everything that's in those books, we could literally type a couple questions in ChatGPT, or we could even ask Alexa or Google, and they'll instantly give us that information within a matter of seconds versus the time it would take to find the letter in the bookcase, find the book, scroll through the book and find the information. And even then it's only a fraction of the information. I may find something about the Roman empire, but it won't tell me anything about the emperor. I need to go to another damn book to find out the information about the emperor when I could just keep going through this circulation of content through ChatGPT or through Alexa to get that information as my brain is saying, okay, that's, in that's, that's interesting. But what about this? What about that? Imagine doing that with books. It, it would, it, you'd probably catch a stroke just trying to capture that caliber of information at scale and the time it would take. Yeah, great example. I mean, uh, just the time saved over the last 20 years or 30 years, like if, you know, when people were just looking into encyclopedias versus what we have access to now. I mean, yeah. forget about it. Yeah. Insane. <laughs> yeah. We're going to talk a little bit about mistake number three, right? Okay. So this is uh, neglecting ethical and regulatory considerations. Because it's the wild, wild west a little bit right now with AI, I guess this is why I think it's important to, to kind of mention that, you know, you should, whether you're, you're, you think that you should be a little bit more creative with your tactics and strategies, mm -hmm. uh, there is a mistake if you kind of overlook ethical and regulatory because that, mm -hmm. that is going to come. It's just a matter of time. And uh, the better that we also understand the situation, what the uh, complications or some of the considerations are, uh, I think that's critical. So I would love to know from you, mm. how, how do kind of folks stay resilient and aware and kind of uh, get ahead of these concerns? And I can give you a real world examples because I, I use it all the time. It, it really goes back into infusing in the reality that the content that the, that the platforms have access to the human brain cannot comprehend the magnitude of it. So utilize that program. So an example of this, if I have a client, which I had clients before, and I wanted to write them an actual email or write them a letter, the first thing I'm going to do is obviously tell the AI to write it in a particular fashion. And what I've learned is just say, hey, write it like a attorney write it like this type of attorney, write it like a trademark attorney, because again, it has access to everything that an attorney would have to research to actually write that letter in the first place. So as long as I tell it to do it in the format of an attorney, and then I say, hey, this is the variables. This is, hey, this person forgot to pay their bill. This person is past 90 days. Here, here's a copy of the contract. I'll put the contract in there as well too. So it has the reference points to the contract. And then it also thinks like an attorney. And then I say, hey, what's the best way for me to then resolve this situation? Enter. Your results are going to be there because they're coming from an attorney standpoint that has all the databases of all the laws. It's coming from your contract that has all the pinpoints of information, the contracts, the signatures and everything. And then it has the variable to say, how do I resolve this issue? That in the past, you'd have to pay a lawyer, go back and forth to figure all that out read the contract, read the email, approve the email, when you could do all that in less than five minutes in today's world. So that's the way I do it. I would say use the system to help you with the system, pound for pound. Yeah, I love that. And it, it's not perfect, but I feel like uh, it definitely gets you a hell of a long way down the road, right? It gets you to the point to where at least if you wanted to go to a lawyer, the lawyer would look at you like, are you a lawyer? Because now you're giving them content that they would have had to create lawyers charge per hour. So essentially you could get a lawyer for an hour and say, here's my contract, here's my agreement, here's my paperwork, here's my email. I just need you to review it and tweak it and modify it if you need to. Because again, everything that they have access to besides the experience is already out there in the world of ether and in, in, in the internet. So it's just a matter of stacking that information in and giving it to them. And nine out of 10 times what lawyers do, they'll go to some like 
intern or somebody behind the scenes and say, hey, I need you to review this contract. I need you to pull this book. I need you to pull this information. I need you to pull this from this case and consolidate all this information and then bring it to me. That's all we're doing. We're consolidating the information and we're presenting it, presenting it to the lawyer much like the intern would. And then the, the lawyer just has to approve that content, but it costs them way less because now they're only spending 30 minutes on it versus having their team pull four or five, maybe 10 hours worth of data to get that contract assembled. Yeah, I, I mean, I love that. And I, I think that like punching out a little bit, like you're, you're talking about just um, using all of these like, advantages right for someone who may not have all the resources at hand because big companies can can spend a lot of money and whatever mm -hmm. and get things done it's all about you know manpower that at that point uh but now like we actually can catch up a little bit right like the smaller players can think about how to use these things oh, get there and yeah yeah of course uh having a lawyer actually look it over to make sure at the end of the day is great but that'll only cost you one hour versus like the uh 15 that might uh, you know be from scratch yeah. so pretty pretty good pretty good i yeah, love yeah. that and, and that works for everything. I mean, if you're applying for a job, I mean, most people, when they apply for a job, they may not even read the entire description. So again, if AI knows who you are and it knows the description of the job and then you apply both of them and then you ask it a question by putting both data points in there, it'll be able to tell you how to essentially apply for that job or put your best foot effort or even rewrite your resume to suit that job. Again, it, it makes it, I, I'm just happy that I was alive in this time frame because it's kind of like my brain was designed for this. And so if I was born maybe 80 years before, I, I probably would have been like going completely ape shit because I, I wouldn't have the resources. You know what I'm saying? So like where we are right now, it's such a useful time to leverage this technology. Take advantage of it. Yeah, I say I wanted to ask you a little bit. I wanted to kind of zoom out, right? We mm -hmm. talk a lot about AI, entrepreneurship, marketing, SEO, but I think it's important to get the human angle here. And like the fact that you've been through so many things and that you've like, like you said, your brain is kind of melded for this. Uh, what would you, what kind of advice would you give to folks that are listening about kind of having that resilience, kind of maintaining your focus and thinking about this long-term success? Uh, AI or not, but like, I think from your perspective, I would love to hear how you kept yourself motivated and how you kind of kept yourself really competitive. I would say start listening. Okay. If we're talking from a business aspect in association to an individual like myself, I would say, listen to feedback from your, your, your avatar or, or your client or, or your customers, because they're going to dial in. And every once in a while you have these general conversations. And to give you an example of that, I remember in the past before who I am right now, I would have clients that would say, you're really good with technology. And I'm like, we're talking about graphic design. And then I would hear somebody, oh, you're really good with this. And I'm like, we're talking about web design. Again, and I would discredit the fact of the technology aspect until I realized, like, that's my gift. It's like I'm almost to the point to where I wish I could plug in an Ethernet cord into a damn outlet somewhere and just be connected to the system on a regular basis, like on matrix level. So once I kind of listen to my clients and embrace those compliments as my strong suit, that's when I started to become who I am. So a lot of people, they may hear it and they may deny it. They may not, oh, I, that's not who I want to be. I want to be this. But if you're doing this naturally great and you're doing it without even thinking about it, imagine how great you would be if you would just apply to it. If you would just take ownership of it versus trying to be X when you're really Y. Yeah, I think that's a key lesson to to kind of take to heart here, um, which actually brings me to another kind of related question that I think was really important for everyone listening. And that is, um, if you could go back 20 years to a, a former self and you would think about how uh, you might give that, give that version of yourself advice um, in the pursuit of this entrepreneurial dream, mm. knowing how technology was going to change, mm. what, would, what would you tell yourself? It's kind of debatable, right? Because I mean, if I did not go that route, I don't think I would be as um, well-rounded as I am right now. But if I can go back and add anything else to who I am, I would have probably fought to learn more so about um, programming on another level. Like I would have learned programming and physics. To like, And then the other thing I would add to that would have been human psychology. Those three different things in a combination. I mean, obviously the elements of what I do right now in all of them, but they're through osmosis, just through doing something, just through conversations. But I would have focused, I would have went to school and honed in on those three different things. Because again, if you look at where we are in society right now, psychology is, is a primo. Now, you necessarily not a moneymaker, but the psychology applied to technology 
that's where the money is. It's like, why does a human want to use that? Why does someone need that or want that? And then applying that to the actual system. Prime example, Amazon. Amazon, they follow psychology so well to the point to where Prime wouldn't have existed if people didn't need or want or require shipping <laughs> to be done faster and then apply all these extra things that come with it, like free music, free books, uh, free movies, all that comes with an actual Prime subscription that gives you expedited shipping, because that's what it was really about. So think about that from the psychology standpoint, understanding that people want to purchase something, but they need it quicker, they need it faster. And then you become the market leader for that. Now you have everyone else from like FedEx to UPS to Walmart and even the US government trying to play catch up with the overnight shipping, which they're not there yet, but Amazon is. Yeah, the psychology aspect is intriguing, and I think it's also very overlooked. Uh, I, I had spoken to uh, Brooks Lockett on a previous episode, and we talked a lot about uh, that psychology and in copywriting. And I think that's like a key aspect. If you understand your audience, if you understand who you're trying to target, it's a lot easier to paint that journey and then use tools the right way, right? hundred percent, a hundred percent. So I, I would just say it, it's it's one of the things that maybe today you may not have to go to school for it but at least know that there is psychology. There are different types of people. And to keep in mind, in a world of 8 billion people, it is seamlessly impossible for you to satisfy all 8 billion people. Even Beyonce and, and Taylor Swift, they're at the billion level and they cannot satisfy all 8 billion people. Hence why they're both equally yoked for different reasons. Yeah, yeah incredible point. <laughs> I hadn't really followed it too much until until all the, the hype was put out there. And I'm like, there's a reason that hype exists. Uh, it's not just the PR machine, but they're doing something a little different. Yeah. And the, the IQs as well. I mean, I mean, Taylor Swift IQ is, is pretty much off the charts as well, too. So, I mean, she plays into that. She, you know, and, and you got to think about most consumers, to be frank, like they're they're not at an intellectual level that's on a premium. Like most people, they just want to kind of just go to their day to day, make their money, go on vacation and live their life. And again, that's the majority versus the minority. So if you're part of the minority, you have to figure out how do you communicate with them? Most people that are highly intellectual, when they write books, they'll write books at a fifth grade level. When they can write books at a professional level to where they're, they're talking in front of like people that have doctors and, and, and beyond master degrees, right? So you have to understand if I'm talking to a quantity of people, you have to dumb it down. And I hate to say it, but idiocracy is a real thing. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of that movie. <laughs> idiocracy was kind of a fun one to watch yeah. for that reason. Uh, but I feel like a lot of that stuff is actually coming, coming to life, which is scary. It is scary. But again, the more people we have, you have to think about it from, from that movie standpoint, right? I mean, people that are highly intellectual, highly intelligent, they may not have time to have kids versus people that are not have way more time to have kids. And then that genome repeats and repeats and repeats. It's, it's almost scientific when you look at it from that perspective, right? It's the rule of numbers. Darwin be damned. <laughs> it's, it's kind of like uh, not how people refer to him normally, right? Yeah. His work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me encourage uh, listeners to kind of unleash their own uh, entrepreneurial potential and think about the power of AI and that resilience. But first, I kind of wanted to like push it over to you, um, SA, and see if there are any like resources that you would kind of put out there as uh, really valuable for folks that are listening right now. I, I think this entire conversation obviously is, is, a, is a primo as far as resources, podcasts. Again, if you're into any subject matter, nine out of 10 times in today's world, as of right now, there should be a podcast that should fulfill those requirements. Start there. Because again, that content could be consumed as you want to consume it, whether you're jogging down the street, whether you're taking a shower, or whether you're riding in the car. So use that to your benefit, right? And then secondary after that, after podcasts, I would say we're talking about AI. AI, you're scared of it. You have to kind of move past the, the, the fear of it and just start playing with it. Play with it in a, in a social aspect. And I know it's going to sound crazy. Almost personify it. Make it into a personality and then have like intellectual conversations, have dumb conversations, have dumb questions, have smart questions. So again, you have an opportunity to dial into the psychology of the masses through a portal that has access to data that the masses don't even are not even aware of. 
Yeah, I, I love that. And and the interesting thing about data, right, is is when you see it in numbers, you see it in a spreadsheet, it doesn't really resonate that much. But then when you see what AI can deliver based on the data that is in that same format, yeah. uh, it, it just changes the way that you think just a little bit. And, and that's why I think people are scared because they don't really understand it. And I think if you understand that basic premise uh, and, and listen to folks like you, that are, are using it and understanding it and trying to get to like ahead of it yeah. uh, even. I think that that provides so much value to someone who is struggling with maybe grabbing onto it and using it. Mm. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. I would just say for, for people that are getting into it, think mm -hmm. of AI as the, the, the greatest historian. Because again, everything has been done before and now we're kind of evolving. But prime example, like we talked about the Roman Empire in an actual encyclopedia. Well, mm -hmm. Who came before Roman? Who came after Roman? And again, like all this information is, is is available. Like, like who was the emperor? Who was the emperor of this year? Right? Like, why was he the emperor? Like, what? Like, what battles did he win? All this different information to dial in that would take so much time. You can kind of consume it at a faster rate to get to the actual result that you're looking for way quicker. That's a, amazing. I, I I want to like kind of ask you. Uh, how folks can kind of keep in touch with you and, and follow you, because I think that uh, I've, I've seen nothing but endless like value coming from your podcasts and some of the like uh, material, like articles you've been putting out there. We just love uh, to, to let you kind of take the floor and let people know how to how to reach you. I mean, I just I just keep it simple. I mean, kind of going back to brand. I, I, I want the, the the brand that I'm building and develop to be at the point to where you should be able to type in Boston Cage in anything and you should get some kind of result. So that means if you go to Amazon, you type in Boston Cage, you should get all of our books, right? If you go to Google, you type in Boston Cage, and if we're not dominating the first five pages, I'm doing something wrong on my back end. So just make it simple. Type in Boston Cage and whatever search that you use and take it from there. Whether it's our books, whether it's our academy, whether it's our videos on YouTube, whether it's our podcast, whatever talks to you, we should have something that's out there for you. So what's your newest endeavor before we break here? Like what, what is the, the, the newest thing that's kind of got caught your eye? Um, so, I mean, obviously it is re-engineering re some old stuff. Like right now, my team for the past six months, they've been rebuilding our bostoncage.com website to consolidate all of our different tentacles. So we've had maybe about 120 different subdomains for different things, directories, our academy, like, um, landing pages so i was like okay now it's time for us to consolidate it so right now they're building out like the first 120 pages of that uh, we have 1200 pages to build so the goal would be to then release this new website that should be a monstrous seo friendly driven content exploration of podcasts video uh, our podcast network our academy all the different things that we we built in the past two th two to three years and then after that is going to be a new release of our online academy. Uh, it kind of goes back to what we were saying. Like, what would it look like to have access to um, 10,000 ebooks, 10,000 audiobooks, 10,000 summaries, 10,000 courses, and collectively all within this environment of Boston Cage? That's the next phase that we're going. All right. All right. That That's a big undertaking, I have to say. It sounds actually uh, monumental, but... Um, yeah, thank you, S.A. Grant. This has been an amazing discussion. I, I think that's uh, just uncovered so many things for folks. Yeah, yeah, I definitely appreciate it. I appreciate you having me on the show again today. And for the listener, if I can give you one last bit of advice, it's just start taking action on the information that not only what I've delivered, but other information that you've heard on other podcasts or other Google results or other YouTube videos is one thing to see the content is one thing to be inspired by it. But if you're not taking action, you're never going to get the results that you're inspiring or wanting to get. If you're just collecting data and you're not actually taking action on that data. Amazing. Let's leave it there. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to phraseology plus AI. We hope that you enjoyed today's episode as much as we enjoyed creating it. And on YouTube, please like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. And of course, feel free to comment. Remember, stay curious, stay informed, and keep listening for more. Until next time, take care and happy listening.